everyone welcome back uh, to the second session <clears throat> as we continue in chapter five what makes a local uh, a local church strong um, we covered the importance of having a vision and being able to communicate that vision with your team and your congregation and the importance of emphasizing on the word and the spirit having a a good balance and five key focus uh, areas to strengthen the local church one is evangelism discipleship uh, prayer and worship fellowship uh, equipping for ministry saints being equipped for ministry right and uh, the importance of preparing for pulpit ministry uh, how do you as uh, the leaders of a church uh, where, which at whatever capacity that you're uh, that you're functioning as as a leader, the seriousness and the importance and the significance uh, of the of preparing for pulpit ministries. Right, uh, the last statement that says there was each time we minister, we are nurturing people uh, into one of these five areas, and so uh, we have to make it count. Right. So moving on to page thirty six uh, in your notes how to continue to strengthen the local church or oh, one of the things what makes a local church strong another aspect um, is a church where people are of one heart and one mind right someone mentioned unity john mentioned unity uh, but here we are uh, so first corinthians uh, paul writes to the corinthians uh, he says now i plead with you brethren uh, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you but that you may be that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in same judgment um, right mark 3 25 it says and if a house is divided against itself the house cannot stand uh, is there anything about unity that can be said that hasn't already been said uh, we all understand the significance the importance of uh, unity and the damage that it can cause uh, when there is no unity uh, wherever you know whichever team that you're part of uh, it could be a team at church or, or at work uh, wherever right schools colleges if you're part of a team and if you the team is not in sync uh, then it's not going to look nice yeah at the moment uh, the football team that i support is uh, they have united in the name but uh, they are not united at all so it's a pretty bad scene at the moment so <laughs> uh, the unit, the unity is powerful isn't it um uh, again so in his letter to the corinthians he's uh, paul uh, is uh, saying to the believers at corinth to speak the same thing uh, to be the of the same mind to flow together in perfect unison and to ensure that there are no divisions uh, among them okay now one, one one of the things that we need to keep in mind is unity is not uniformity Okay, uh, there is a difference. We're not going to do a word study right now, but I'm just putting it out there. Unity is not uniformity. Okay, so I said one of the things is uh, he mentions is to flow together in perfect unison, right? Now, if you uh, are all part of a choir, now if you've ever been part of a choir, uh, you know, we can all sing in unison. That means we can all sing just one part uh, and or there are four part harmonies that you can sing in a choir right uh, so there are the sopranos the altos the tenors um, sometimes the baritones and then the bass okay and if i'm sure we've all at least heard a choir sing uh, they're all singing the same song but they are singing in different harmony different pitches uh, but it all sounds like one beautiful thing isn't it um, and so that's why I said, okay, unity is not necessarily uniformity. It can look, you know, um, very different, but there's something beautiful uh, about it, right? So, as pastors and leaders, we must teach people to be of one heart and one mind. Okay, it it always, whatever it is, guys, whichever culture that you're wanting to set, it always flows from the top. 
okay water always flows down right? you, you never see a water flowing going up isn't it as uh, so the river always flows down so uh, everything every culture that wants to be set has to come down from the leadership uh, if this is what you want to see as a senior pastor of your church uh, it has to come from you right um, because that's that, that that's how it is and and we know about this in the, from the scriptures as well from the old testament uh, when you read about it and say uh, in first chronicles chapter 16 uh, and 15 uh, when all the you know levites and the priests they all it says they were all gathered together and they uh, sang in one voice and everyone played together as one uh, and then you see that time and time again in, in Solomon's temple as well, when they worshipped and they lifted up their voice as one, or they, you know, and then come fast forward to uh, Book of Acts chapter two, they were gathered together in one accord, in one mind. Uh, then God moved. Uh, God shows up. He manifests Himself where there is unity among people, uh, and. And so of everything, you know, that we are trying to uh, accomplish with our church by strengthening them, uh, unity is, um, to, say, uh, to say the least, uh, is it's important, right? Um, you have to just work towards building that. You have to constantly encourage people to work in teams, to work together, to combine each other's uh, strengths, et cetera, and whatnot, okay? And that's not easy uh, because, a bunch of individuals we have our own characters we have uh the things that we like uh, things that we don't like and whatnot uh but that's where teamwork comes into play so uh, there are there's so many resources online that you already know uh, you know in terms of leadership in terms of teamwork uh if you have to do say some teamwork activities what you know just do it just to build that unity that oneness uh amongst each other right and in the notes it says a lot depends on the pastor or leader if the pastor or leader himself or herself is insecure puts people down is divisive in nature works by manipulation operates by a divide and rule approach backbites controls slanders people the local church will be a reflection of this amen Okay, right. Uh, it all comes down. Uh, it all depends on the leader. It starts with the leader. Okay, so unity in the church is crucial for the strengthening of a local church. Uh, and the next thing is uh, the church that is equipping and releasing people into their God-appointed function. Uh, we've already read this uh, before in Ephesians chapter four, verse eleven and twelve. It says, "And he himself gave." some to be apostles some prophets some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry for the edifying of the of the body of christ um, and so one of the objective of the fivefold ministry gifts is for the equipping of the saints uh, it's one of the objectives and it's a very key objective uh, it's growing in maturity, and I've I've said that so many many times, isn't it? And uh, new believers need to be discipled and then equipped to become ministers of God. New believers cannot stay as new believers. Uh, you know, I was just teaching about the Tabernacle of Moses to the third years, uh, how the Tabernacle of Moses has the gates, uh, you know, the outer courts, the inner courts, and the holy of holies. Uh, you know, most of us enter through the gate. Uh, Jesus says, I am the gate, uh, right? He enters through the gate and we are in the outer courts. We are satisfied being in the outer courts. We don't want to go into the inner courts. And then some of us will go choose to go into the inner courts and then not really progress into the holy of holies, um, right? I think like most of us, uh, it is possible that we are just very satisfied and content at being the outer court Christian believers uh, while there is an invitation for us to go all the way in. To the holy of holies right so um that is all about you know equipping uh the saints uh, just taking them saying it's like hey there is more there is more let's go all the way uh, past the outer courts uh, into the uh, most holy place okay um, and the next section is talking about a church that is relevant to the world it is in 
uh, relevant to the world that it is in. Um, so, guys, what are you know we are you all know the time that we are living in. Yes, okay, you all are aware of the time that we are living in, day and age, uh, so to speak. Uh, how can uh, the church be relevant uh, in today's day and time? Uh, another question. Sorry, uh, do you think the church is relevant uh, in this day and age? Yes, no, maybe. Is that a hard question, guys? Yeah, can I try? Yeah, sure, Isaac. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, I think the church is relevant or should be relevant for the teaching of morals and uh, uh, religious standards. I think the church is relevant. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, all right, and what else? Some churches are, but some are not. <laughs> okay. Is the church relevant today? If yes, how? If no, what can we do to be relevant? I believe church is relevant today. Reason being people are in need. People are losing uh, their faith in God or um, faith in themselves. And church is the only place where um, they can come in a relationship with God um, to find the ultimate purpose of their lives. So church is ever important, and especially at this time and age. OK, yeah, thanks, uh, JP. Anything else, guys? What else? Yes, um, like uh, John was saying, the church is relevant or should be relevant because, <clears throat> as we already know, we, we, ha we have two worlds. The moral world, that is the, the kingdom of God, and then the kingdom of darkness, that is the king of the world. Mm -hmm. And like John was saying, people are more nowadays, people are going more towards materials, you know, the things of the world, they are so driven. So the church should be a Bitcoin factor, again, to bring people back to the kingdom of God. Yeah. That's my belief. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, what else? I'm still waiting on. Sid, uh, did you raise your hand? Yes, Pastor. Pastor, I would like to share something. Like, I don't know about the Bangalore culture, but in Delhi, uh, there is a mixed crowd. Means the old people who are coming from that old kind of Christianity background, they are like very much strong in their belief. But the young generation, they are coming to them. It looks, it looks like a very dramatic thing. Like mm -hmm. when there is a manifestation of Holy Spirit and all, to the young people, it looks like it is our all drama. But to the people like who are old from old background they think like it is the manifestation of holy spirit science wonders and miracles are happening so what is my perspective in that to the younger generations the church may not be that relevant as it is relevant to the old people okay like so young, the... yeah like young people they are not able to relate it okay. as they should okay so I think the, the topic of being relevant uh, all comes down to how do we uh, teach and uh, you know share about the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit in a way that it is relevant because we can't compromise and say, okay, just because they are thinking it's weird, we can't say, okay, I'm not going to teach or preach on it. Um, right? So, I mean, I think we kind of get the picture of with what Sid was saying, isn't it? Um, 
It's uh, in First Corinthians chapter nine, verse nineteen and twenty-three. Uh, hey, thanks, Sid, for sharing that. So First Corinthians nine, nineteen to twenty-three says, "For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law." To those who are without law, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I am, I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. Right. Uh, so in the notes it says, God speaks in the language of the people whom he is speaking to. Okay, that's a very significant line there. It's, right? God speaks in the language of the people whom he is speaking to. Okay, so, so we can go to pause and we just say, okay, if God is the ancient of days, right? Uh, he's from everlasting to everlasting, he is God. Uh, think about the number of generations that he has seen uh, go before us, the current generation, uh, the ways that he's spoken to them, the things that he's seen them do uh, and learn and minister and whatnot. Uh, you know, nothing can take God by surprise, or no generation, Gen X, Y, Z, or Z, can take God by surprise. Uh, he is not shaken, or he is not taken by surprise. Uh, He's not moved with anxiety or whatnot. Okay, oh boy, here comes uh, Generation Z. They are all into technology and phones and whatnot. Uh, you know, what are we going to do? No, he's not moved or shaken. Uh, he's he's still God, and he has he, you know he's a spirit of wisdom. Um, he knows how to speak to this generation, every generation, in the language that they speak, right? And so that's where the Apostle Paul, in describing how he went about uh, ministry, essentially sums it up. I have become all things to all men that I might, uh, I might by all means save some, right? And so the Message Bible uh, says this: even though I am free of the demands and expectations of everyone, okay, just please follow along with me uh, as I read that one more time. Even though I am free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people religious non-religious meticulous moralists loose living immoralists the defeated the demoralized whoever i didn't take on their way of life i kept my bearings in christ that's very important right the, those lines i didn't take on their way of life i kept my bearings in christ but I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I've become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into God's saved life. Right. So uh, Paul attempted to communicate in a way that the people whom he was trying to reach would understand the gospel and also see it in him. Now, this kind of wisdom and knowledge can only come from God. Uh, you know, when you're uh, and you're trying to address so many different groups of people, communities of people. You know, I mean, think about what the list of people that he's mentioned there. To the Jews, he became a Jew. Uh, to the Gentiles, he became a Gentile. To the poor, he became a poor. Uh, it's easy for us to just say, okay, Jew, he became a Jew. Gentile, he became a Gentile. You know, just think about it. Jews had their way of lifestyle, right? their way of living. Right? They believed in a believed in a certain things like this is what you have to do when you wake up in the morning, and this is what you have to do before you go to bed, whatnot. So every every uh, community or group will have their own way of living a life, isn't it? And for Paul to say that, okay, you know, I kept my core strong. That means I did not, you know, uh, the, like the message says, I kept my bearings in Christ. I did not take on their way of life. But I was, I became relevant uh, so that I can save people from every uh, group, every community, right? So uh, it's important for us to be uh, relevant, guys, okay? so, because the world around us is changing, uh, and 
while we don't change the message of the gospel, uh, the way we communicate or you know share the gospel uh, has to change or progress, um, right? So the local church has to be relevant in the community that it is in. Um, are you guys with me? Uh, anything else that you'd like to add? Okay. Uh, right, and page 38 and uh, 39, as, uh, as one big point, it talks about a church that is raising up uh, leaders. A church that is raising up leaders in uh, Galatians 2 verse 9 it says, And when James, Caiaphas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they uh, and they to the circumcised. Okay. Um, so this point is talking about, and this I want to talk about this and and the next point is about uh, leaders are the pillars in the house of God, uh, raising up leaders. And uh, we saw uh, how the how the deacons came about, right? And deacons and elders and. And they are all nothing but leaders in their own way, isn't it? So the apostles saw, okay, to serve people better, we need to raise leaders, a spiritual leaders. So they went and found the deacons who can serve food, uh, you know, and whatnot, and then elders. And so they what 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 they were doing is that they were raising up leaders. And so in your church, where God places you, where God where God has placed you, it cannot be a one man show, um, right? It simply cannot be a one-man show because you will not last long, <laughs> uh, right? Okay, uh, I, you know I'm the founder of this church. I'm going to do everything because I want people to see me. Uh, I want people to know about me. It's got to be only about me uh, because I want everybody to see how hardworking I am. <laughs> it's, I, I mean, it's not going to last long if you don't raise leaders. Raising up leaders, raising good leaders, is very important, and it takes time uh, right it takes time it takes time that you meet with those leaders you recognize them and then you begin to nurture them right coming back to that word is where we nurture them okay so what will happen is that if we don't raise leaders if you come down to page 39 uh, for example you you'll read this uh, passage of scripture in judges chapter 2 verse 7 to 11 it says, so the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. And they buried him within the border of his inheritance at Timnah Heres, in the mountain of Ephraim, on the north side of Mount Gash. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, one generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. Um, right, so we simply put, um, if we don't raise a generation of next leaders, uh, just like what, what we read in Judges chapter 2, we will lose an entire generation uh, to the kingdom of the world. Uh, and so we need to echo, we need to train. And that's what discipleship is all about, isn't it? Uh, is you, you equip them uh, and then you, you teach them about the word of God. You teach them about who this God is and you raise them up. You make them better people, make them, you build them as leaders, you raise them up in your church uh, and then so that they can uh, you know uh, follow and have that continuity right and uh, just about in page th at the bottom of page 38 it talks about uh, is this passage of scripture from second timothy 2 1 and 2 right it says you therefore my son be strong in the grace that is in jesus that is in christ jesus and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. 
Okay, so just as Paul invested into Timothy, is, is he is encouraging Paul? Okay, just as I've done with you, you do with those whom you see fit, who are faithful. You teach them, and so they will also continue to teach others also. So uh, the continuity uh, is very important. Right? What happens uh, to your ministry after you are gone? Uh, right. So uh, that's the end of chapter five. I want to leave with that. And um, but I just want to pause here and ask: Is there any questions, uh, guys? Do you have any questions? Any thoughts that you want to share? It, uh, just one of the points that I just remembered uh, on talk, talking about relevancy is uh, uh, we all know about Billy Graham, uh, you know, wonderful evangelist. Uh, in the, I think it was about somewhere in ninety two or ninety three, uh, he invited Michael W. Smith to come and uh, lead worship in his crusade, one of his crusade. And uh, there was a lot of opposition uh, for that. It's like, why are you inviting Michael W. Smith? I mean, although he was a Christian artist, uh, it was his his way, his music, Michael W. Smith back then, 93, was, was almost how many years ago? 30, 40 years ago. 30, uh, is, uh, he was a very young and upcoming musician, artist, worship leader, and whatnot. Uh, and his people, his team are wondering, like, why are you inviting Michael W. Smith? You know, we are old school just sing some hymns and move on but billy graham saw that okay to be relevant to the young audience he knew that okay they would come uh to the music that is relevant of that day and age and so uh he, he had michael Blue smith lead worship so there are so many ways that you can uh, be relevant uh to reach out to the generation uh that you want to reach out to yeah um Okay, um, this chapter six is the conclusion of uh, section one, uh, right? It talks about church growth principles. Okay, some of the principles uh, uh, that, that we can follow uh, for church growth, okay? Uh, we, we've spoken about the word growth, uh, you know, the meaning of it and what it means for you and the importance of it and how God looks at growth and, and how growth is God's idea. Uh, and we know that God's ideas are always good. That means growth is a good thing, right? Uh, God desires for all of us to be fruitful. Um, the Father is glorified when we are fruitful. That's the first line of chapter 6, right? The Father is glorified when we are fruitful. Right? John 15 verse 8, it says, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Okay, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. Okay, um, and so one of the aspects in which the local church must be fruitful is in continuously winning people to the Lord and growing in numbers. One aspect, okay? Uh, it's very important, uh, those first two words. One aspect in which the local church must be fruitful, okay? Some of us, it is possible to read it as the only aspect in which the local church must be fruitful. No, it's one of the aspects, one of many, okay? Uh, the local church must be fruitful is in continuously winning people to the Lord and growing in numbers. Okay, so some of the, uh, the principles um, of in this chapter are put together by uh, uh, the key principles by uh, Yonggi Cho. Uh, Yonggi Cho, uh, David Yonggi Cho is a co-founder of and the senior pastor of a Yoido full gospel church in Seoul, Korea. Um, right? I mean, he started that in 1958, guys. And by the way, I've heard my grandma talking about David Paul uh, Yonggi Cho coming to go to KGF, Kolar Goldfield. I mean, that's another town close uh, to Bangalore. It's two hours from Bangalore and whatnot. Have crusades there. And uh, and you can imagine how young I was when, and if he started the churches in 1958. Yeah, <laughs> <It's> pretty big. <laughs> by the time I was grow, I was born. Um, 
So uh, he started, it says, uh, in a, a tent with only five members. And within 30 years, he, his church, his congregation grew up to 800,000 um, people. And that's pretty huge, right? And there are a lot of his workshops, his seminars on YouTube, guys. Um, you know, once again, I would encourage you to you know make time to listen to him. Uh, it's, it's very encouraging. He's one of the generals, God's generals, uh, I would say, uh, in in the kingdom, uh, right? So uh, some of the principles that's mentioned are, are you know are taken from some of his teachings, right? Um, the first thing, what he mentions. Uh, is have a vision of a large growing church. We just spoke about vision, isn't it? Uh, what makes a local church strong? The first thing is vision. Uh, and one of the, what's the first principle for a growing church? Vision. Okay. Uh, oh, it's, it's just amazing, isn't it? The emphasis on vision. Um, so the church grows through your visions and dreams, he says. Um, so it says, church grows, starts in your heart. Okay, the church growth starts in your heart, starts with a vision in your heart. Uh, you already have a vision of what your church should look like, uh, you know, how big your church should look like, whatever. Uh, right, okay, it should have this, so and so, so and so. You already have an in your heart you already have a blueprint you know up here right and just and so that's when uh, you see it come into fruition right so the church grows through your visions and dreams um, it goes on to say that it is not that you that makes the vision but it is the vision that makes you so when you have the Holy Spirit inspired vision in your heart, then the vision is going to make you. The vision will change you. Okay. Um, so Romans chapter 4 verse 17 says, What you can see, you can handle. God calls things that are not as though they are. We all know that scriptures, right? Um, in Genesis 13, it says, what you can see, you can have. God told Abraham, the land which you can see, I will give to you. Okay, the land that you can see, a vision, basically, uh, have a revelation of. Okay, um, so um, there's also, by the way, uh, a huge difference between sight and vision. Okay, so right now, I'm able to see everything that is in front of me. I have a sight, you know. Uh, although it is, it can be misinterpreted as vision. Um, There's a partly truth. I do have vision, but I also have sight. What it is is sight. But vision is uh, much more different than um, than sight. Okay. So to get a God-given uh, vision uh, for your ministry, uh, because guys, we say your ministry, uh, what God's called you to do. Uh, think about it. It's his work at the end of the day, right? Uh, if God's called you to do into ministry for something to you know to save the lost or to go into missions and whatnot, it doesn't become your thing. You're sure that's your calling, uh, but it is his work. So you know it's he's the boss and he's the one who who has to give you uh, the plans, the strategies. Okay, you know, hey. This is my work. This is my project. <laughs> you know, you, this is how you ought to do it uh, and whatnot. So it's so important for us to lean into his heart, get uh, the vision, the heartbeat uh, from him, um, from the Holy Spirit, for us to do his work, uh, the work of his kingdom here on earth, right? Okay, uh, the second principle is have a strong burning desire for a large growing church. Okay, have a strong burning desire for a large growing church. Your desire gives power to the vision and your vision increases your desire. Okay, your vision, your desire gives power to the vision and your vision increases um, your desire. When you have desire, you will pray day in and day out and you will work tirelessly. Uh, would you guys agree? Uh, you know what? What is a power of desire? 
Do you think having desire is important to feed your vision and vice versa? Yeah. Yeah, desire. Um, I'm just thinking, yeah, desire is something like thirst for water that unless you get it, you won't be satisfied. It's running after it. Yeah. And you need to get it to just to survive at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just looking at this choice of words and the progression of those words. It says, your desire gives power to the vision. Okay. I, I want to share an example, but it's just so silly and it can be so funny, but please forgive me. Uh, uh, maybe it's just my uh, thing. So your desire gives power to the vision. Um, say, for example, uh, I mean, I'm saying this because, uh, okay, this is a uh, person who goes to the gym, who wants to go to the gym. Okay. At the moment, it looks very different. But then he's had a vision of how he should look like he or she should look like. Okay, like yeah, I gotta lose that one pack and get a six pack. <laughs> That's the desire, right? Uh, and that, and so he's gonna say, okay, I gotta lose this one pack and have that six pack. And so he has a vision, and so he's gonna move in that desire to just work out, uh, you know, lose all the fat. Uh, and uh, and then the second part of the statement says, your vision increases your desire. So you've been working out, uh, you've been consistent, you've been disciplined in what you eat, uh, you've been disciplined in your working out schedule every day, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then, okay, you're seeing change and you're seeing uh, difference in, uh, in, 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 the, in, in, in the way that your body is transforming. And that increases your desire. It's like, okay, I can see this. Okay, there's a little bit of change. I can see my tummy is almost flat now. And uh, that's increasing my desire. It's like, okay, right, this is just some more hard work. Let me get to that thing. Okay, so uh, I told you guys, okay, it's a silly, funny example. So, but then I, I relate to it. <laughs> okay, so when you have the desire, uh, you will pray day in and day out and you will work tirelessly. Um, so have a strong burning desire. And one of the things I've learned about desire is that to, for us to desire more of him, only he can give us that desire. Because in my flesh, I can only desire so much of God. But it is my spirit, man, uh, you know, when that, that can long for more of him. And that desire, that spiritual hunger, that divine hunger and desire can only be birthed in me by the Holy Spirit. Okay, um, so that's one of the principles and uh, engage in continuous prayer and spiritual warfare. Uh, we must be a praying church. Like That's one of the points that we spoke about, isn't it? And how to uh, have a strong church, a strong local church is engage in continuous prayer and uh, spiritual warfare. Uh, don't be shy about teaching or preaching on the topic of spiritual warfare. Equipping your church and the congregation uh, on this topic uh, is very important because uh, uh, we are in the middle of a war, if you like it or not. Okay, um, so we ought to know everything about spiritual warfare there is to know. And uh, okay, so the first thing: have a vision. This is some of the key principles for a growing church. Okay, uh, have a vision, and then have a burning desire. Uh, let your church be a praying church and then that should lead to for us having a, a strong faith in God right uh, we must be determined to stand in faith to see the vision fulfilled because uh, it's going to be challenges um, there has to be challenges there are going to be shortcomings there are going to be uh, good days there are going to be bad days there are going to be really really bad days where you feel like giving up and uh, and not do anything, you know, just give up basically. But then that's when uh, faith is key, right? Faith is the substance of things we hope for and the evidence of things we do not see, uh, right? I like what is mentioned in the notes. It says, uh, faith is not an emotion. Uh, you may not feel it, uh, but it faith is a choice. 
right? Um, so, so there's this APC publication called uh, Speak Your Faith. Uh, it's again available to for a free download. Um, it's all about declaring your faith, the importance of declaring. Um, and so get your hands on that book if you can. Um, it's available for free. Um, it's called Speak Your Faith. Uh, so you must speak your faith, call things that do not exist as though they did. Uh, right. So when you are discouraged, uh, when you don't know what to do, uh, where to go for, what not, declare. Right. The one who's called, one who's started a good work in me, is faithful enough to finish it. Okay. So call it out. Uh, don't lose faith. Uh, declare your and speak your faith. Right. And have a close uh, fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Um, that's. It's again, uh, to have an intimate relationship because intimacy is not a product uh, of of uh, what do we say um, cosmetics, right? Of uh, holiness is not a, a fruit or a result of uh, of cosmetics. Like for example, you don't you don't become holy or righteous by wearing white shirt and white pants and not growing beard or not wearing any jewelries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, right, uh, <laughs> uh, intimacy and um, holiness is a result of communion with God, a fellowship uh, with the Holy Spirit. Uh, right, one person was who was talking about uh, ministry and holiness. He said, uh, "What the what's the first name uh, of the Holy Spirit? The first name is holy. Right, He is holy, and He's inviting us to be holy, and He makes us holy." Um, right, uh, and so it's, and that's when I mean, anytime it, when you're in a formal conversation, uh, you always address them by Mr. Last Name, whatever, right? In different countries, it's different. Some countries, it's their first name or last name, but uh, but to become to develop that close relationship with the Holy Spirit, uh, we need to lean on Him for Him to empower us. To live a holy life. Um, that's the importance of having a close fellowship with the Holy Spirit for the growth uh, of the church, because it is the Holy Spirit that builds the church. Right? It is the Holy Spirit that builds the church. Right? So some of the pointers that's mentioned here is at the bottom of page 42. Uh, first, we must develop a fellowship with the Holy Spirit by spending time with the Holy Spirit. To listen to him and share our feelings and thoughts. Secondly, we must develop a partnership with the Holy Spirit in all our activities. Uh, invite him as a partner in everything you do in your in your day to day lives. Uh, don't compartmentalize and say, "Okay, I'm doing this. I can't have you in what I am doing right now." Uh, if you're if I'm preparing for the Bible College lecture, uh, and I make him a partner with me. Okay teach me, uh, you know, or going to the store to pick up milk or whatnot is like, okay, come, you know, let's take a walk. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the Benny Hinn's old book, uh, and Good Morning Holy Spirit. Uh, it's about inviting, making him a partner in our day, uh, in our everyday life uh, is crucial. Uh, thirdly, we should facilitate the transportation of the Holy Spirit to bring the love and the grace of God uh, to us, to take our prayers and supplications to him. Um, we 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 pray uh, we pray through him and we pray in the spirit. We allow him to minister to us. Uh, we allow him to bring uh, to reveal the love of God and the grace of God to us. Uh, and finally, we should always remember that we are united with the Holy Spirit. We are no longer individuals uh, apart from the Holy Spirit. Okay? Once we are, as soon as we are uh, born again Christians. Uh, we are united with the Holy Spirit. We are united with the Spirit of God. Uh, and just moving down to page uh, 43, four-step process of uh, of incubation or birthing of vision given by the Holy Spirit. Uh, four-step process or incubation of vision given by the Holy Spirit says, first incubation must be done in the context of an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit and in faith. Secondly, we should ask for clear-cut objectives. Third, pray for assurance. Fourth, when we are assured, we must give thanks to God and positively proclaim everything through our mouth. Uh, okay, so this is how we seek for vision. 
right? Because the church growth does not depend on our human cap capabilities or and strategy. Church growth is more than a series of ideas, principles, and techniques. Uh, since the church belongs to the Holy Spirit, the church can only grow if the vision comes from the Holy Spirit. And the foundation and the core of it is all very simple, is that uh, we as leaders and pastors and ministers of God are to spend time with him, to get to know him, at what pleases his heart, and what is what are his plans uh, for your city, for your country, for the place where God's placed you. Um, that's key. Right? And preach to demonstrate God's power. Preach uh, Your preaching must bring heaven um, to earth. And not compromising preaching on the word of God. Uh, right? And so understand the difference between prosperity and greed. Prosperity is God's blessing to his children to meet their needs, to glorify God and to bless others. Greed is characteristic of the devil. So... Um, your preaching must meet people's needs right now through Jesus Christ. Uh, we must preach and minister forgiveness, healing, casting out devils, feeding the hungry, everything that represents the kingdom of God. Right? And uh, it finally talks about his principle about uh, the cell groups. Uh, equip and engage believers in ministry. Okay. Once again, uh, we come down to this point, which we've spoken about so much in Ephesians 4, 4, uh, 4 12 is equipping the saints. It's all about equipping the saints. Um, you raise leaders, uh, you equip the saints, and you, it's like your, your church will grow by itself. Um, right? And this is all about this last point this principle is about he's talking about the cell system that uh, the Yongi Church Church followed, uh, which was started in 1964. Uh, it's a cell system cell group uh, we call it life groups in church uh, on the website you will see the life groups are like the life of the church that's where uh, you know people of the uh, people members of the church are equipped once again discipled um, the way it functions at apc is in our life groups we um, once again meditate on on the sunday sermon of what was taught uh, right, so and that there's a, a small group devotional questions and whatnot, and a lot of things happen in a life group, right? That's where fellowship happens. Uh, every core uh, aspects that we discussed, uh, right? Prayer and worship, uh, evangelism, discipleship, uh, fellowship, uh, saints are being equipped. Everything happens in a cell group, and and the more uh, cell groups, our life groups are organized better. Uh, the growth of the church uh, will also happen um, right naturally or organically so to speak right um, and so just as a conclusion uh, we can say that the church growth is only a byproduct and when the church really becomes the church of the Holy Spirit which develops an intimate communion with the Holy Spirit uh, when the church is a praying church and a fourth dimensional church, when the church takes care of the needs of the people, when the church becomes the church of spiritual blessings, material blessings, that, and blessings in health, and when the church is a lay people and a cell system centered church, the church will certainly grow. Okay, so these are some of the principles from uh, the teachings of uh, uh, David Yongi Cho. Uh, and there are some books that are suggested uh, uh, in page 45 for um, you to read. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's the end of chapter 6 as well, guys. So uh, chapter 5 and chapter 6 are, are kind of connected. Actually, this whole section right now, when you look at it from the hindsight, um, every chapter makes sense and every chapter are so much in sync. And that's why there's so many points uh, repeated uh, over and over again. And so many recurring themes like equipping the saints and the intimacy with God, listening to the Holy Spirit, having a vision. Uh, there are so many points that are repeated and um, and don't ignore those points. And I think it's very crucial, um, you know, for the growth of the church, wherever you, you know, uh, God's planted you to be. Okay. Right, so I um, hope you all are still alive. Everybody's doing good. Uh, well, thanks for joining in. Uh, thanks for being awake. Uh, stop the recording now, and I'll see you all once again next week.
All right, you guys have a lovely weekend. God bless you all. Thank you, Buster.